about Atlantic salmon. Um, so we'll start off with um, Jonah Withers. Uh, can everyone hear me if I'm not using the microphone? Um, so I'm Jonah Withers. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I'm going to talk about the evaluation of landlocked Atlantic salmon, and the recol recolonization of the Boquette River. Uh, I do want to point out I have two additional authors on here, uh, Nick Stas and Jazia hannah Moonstone. just want to give them credit for all the work they've done for this project. Uh, so just a little background for the non-fish people. Uh, Atlantic salmon are distributed throughout the North Atlantic Ocean Basin, ranging from the Arctic Circle to Portugal, Connecticut River, all the way up to Quebec. They're an anadromous species, meaning that they spawn in the fresh water uh, and spend their adult lives in uh, the ocean. Um, and their life cycle, they, they spawn in uh, they spawn in, in fresh water, their eggs uh, in the fall, their eggs over winter. Uh, they hatch out in the spring as, uh, as elven, and then they spend uh, a year or two in the par stage in the river before silvering into the smolts and making their way out to the lake, or excuse me, into the ocean, uh, where they undergo rapid growth rates uh, and sexually mature. In Lake Champlain, uh, there's also a genetically distinct group, um, and in many other lakes throughout the distribution, where they're actually uh, solely found in fresh water. So instead of migrating out to the ocean, uh, they'll spawn freshwater tributaries, but then use the lake uh, as they're, during their uh, dumping life stage. Uh, they're iteroparous, so unlike a lot of other uh, salmon species, they can spawn uh, multiple times throughout their life. They produce roughly six to 700 eggs per pound, and they range in Lake Champlain from about 380 to 680 centimeters, and live between three and six years. Uh, Lake Champlain uh, historically has supported uh, Atlantic salmon throughout its range. It's got great, a great amount of salmon habitat. Nearly 50% of it is considered good adult salmon habitat. Uh, that's because the average depth is almost 20 meters, uh, and you can get as deep as 400 meters at some, or excuse me, 400 feet in some places. So, very deep cold water, which they prefer. And historically, they were found in. Uh, the eight major water, uh, rivers listed here, as well as uh, the Little Lost Sable and Lewis Creek. We have a lot of historical accounts from the 1700s suggesting that they were very prolific and prevalent throughout the lake. Uh, the, I like this stat right here that uh, 500 salmon could be taken from the Boquette River in one day. So we knew they were. High, we know that they were historically highly abundant and utilized uh, culturally. Uh, but then in the 1800s, just like you heard this morning um, in Lake Ontario, Lake Champlain, they were extirpated in the uh, 1840s, and that was due to a lot of anthropogenic stressors, including the development of mills and other dams that blocks fish passage, uh, the industrialization of the area, deforestation, and agricultural uh, practices that led to pollution and habitat degradation and uh, reduction of riparian areas, as well as overfishing. So after just over 100 years, uh, the 1970s, the Lake Champlain Fish and Wildlife Management Cooperative was formed. This was a group um, that consisted of the uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, New York, D.C., and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they initiated the Sal Salmonid Restoration Program. And this group uh, certainly was working on a multitude of species throughout the lake collaboratively, but landlocked Atlantic salmon was a major focus. And initially this group uh, was focusing on setting up a lake fishery, uh, putting a lot of uh, investment in uh, small stocking, and not, uh, not focusing on natural reproduction. But after establishing that lake fishery, um, some new goals have arisen, and, and now we're focusing on uh, river runs of Atlantic salmon. So uh, one of those goals is to increase the returns of hatchery origin salmon, to enhance tributary fisheries, and to restore naturally reproducing river run salmon. And the two target tributaries um, where this initiated was in the Winooski River and the Boquette River. And I'm going to talk about the Boquette River today. So the Boquette River watershed encompasses about 280 square miles. Uh, there's two main branches. There's the north branch and the main stem. Uh, the main stem starts at the uh, flank side of Dix Mountain uh, at about 280 foot elevation. Uh, it goes through about 74 miles of uh, farm and forested area before uh, leading up to the north branch into the uh, Lake 
Champlain. Uh, so stocking's been going on more recently. We were, we were about 55,000 yearlings uh, are stocked out each year in uh, six different locations. Three are in the north branch and three are uh, picked up in yellow in the uh, main stem. And fry were stocked in these two uh, red branches here. And the north branch is really important here. Uh, New York DEC set up a uh, uh, closed fishing period from October 1st to December 31st. And that's because the North Branch has been identified as having really good salmon habitat. So they've set up protections for the restoration efforts, which has been uh, pretty critical. In addition, the, the Boquette River system uh, was identified by the study uh, by USGS, uh, the uh, Nature Conservancy, and uh, a series of other partners who looked at the effects of climate change. And this model basically su suggests that with a two degree increase, uh, two, two degrees Celsius increase throughout the Lake Champlain region, the Boquette River was found to be uh, very resistant to climate change and <coughs> support cold water fish. So very important for brook trout and Atlantic salmon, uh, and specifically in the North Branch. So the North Branch has a protected fishing area, good habitat, and it's uh, uh, predicted to be highly resilient to climate change. So a great place for restoration. So after 150 years, we have some new challenges for restoration. We've got invasive species like alewives. Um, alewives is a, a large forage base of uh, adult Atlantic salmon. Uh, they do produce uh, thymonase, which reduces <coughs> vitamin B. And then uh, sea lamprey that prey on uh, adult Atlantic salmon as well. But we still have the old uh, issues that were at play when the fish was extirpated 150 years ago. There's still habitat degradation in these areas. Uh, with the land use practices and sedimentation, and there still exists uh, some dams and culverts. So the first dam that I want to talk about is the Crowning Shield Dam. It's on the North Branch here. And this is what it looked like um, before 2014. It was impeding all Atlantic salmon upstream passage, but uh, with the work that Madeline Little did and a series of uh, partners, they collaborated to get this dam removed in 2014, and it opened up eight, eight miles of uh, Atlantic salmon habitat. The other impediment was here in Willsboro. This is the Willsboro Dam, or Sawmill Dam. Um, and this was thought to impede Atlantic salmon passage. There was a fish ladder there, but it wasn't uh, working as efficiently as I wanted to or ideally would be. So again, Madeline Little and others put in a lot of effort um, collaborated to get this dam removed in the summer of 2015, um, and that opened up approximately 70 miles of habitat for Atlantic salmon. So by uh, the fall of 2015, <coughs> both Crowning Shield and Willsboro Dam had been removed, uh, leaving the passage into the North Branch uh, pretty much uh, unimpeded um, for many uh, anthropogenic barriers. <coughs> So then uh, the, que the question became, are salmon uh, recolonizing the Boquet River? Uh, there's nothing impeding their progress, so um, we want to go out and assess that. So we set up this study design here. Um, we created five different sections. Uh, this section is uh, where the Willsboro Dam was, just below it. There are some cascades that um, some previous work, uh, telemetry work suggested that fish were still having difficulties getting over the cascades. Um, so we wanted to see what was going on there, fish were getting over it. Uh, and then additionally, there's the, the North Branch that's been identified in, as good habitat and been protected. Uh, and what we did to, to identify uh, re recolonization was look for reds, red surveys. Reds are the nests of Atlantic salmon. Uh, here's one of our uh, technicians out here surveying the river. You walk around, along and throughout the river looking for uh, reds, which are the nests. They're pretty obvious to see. Um, they, scour out some of the substrate and clean it off, so we go along counting these and, and uh, taking GPS one and support the art. And then if we were to find reds, the next question would be, are these reds um, surviving the winter and producing uh, Alvin's green? And to do this, uh, our method was to snorkel, do snorkel surveys. And unlike red surveys, where you can just walk along and see something that's uh, about a meter, uh, instead, we're looking for one inch uh, fish, so it's a lot more tedious. Um, and time consuming to cover a good amount of area. So our sampling uh, design was updated. Instead of using our four branches, we broke them up into 225 meter sections and we'd subsample 50 meter sections within each of those. 
So getting right into the results, um, in 2016 and 2017, I mentioned the cascades uh, were thought to be uh, an impedance for, for fish to get over them. So adult salmon were actually captured below the cascades and uh, passed up to the north branch. And our first year of results, we found uh, 90 uh, nests or, or reds in the suitable habitat area of, of the north branch and 68 below the cascades. The following spring we went out and looked for fry and we found 85 fry, uh, which was the first documentation of, of the reproduction being successful. Um, after using, doing some genetic analysis, we found that the fry that were captured did not come from fish that were lifted. Um, so in theory, these, these uh, the successful spawners that are uh, reproducing um, did not need assistance set up, so we stopped um, moving fish up after that year. Uh, fall of 2017, uh, 32 reds were found in suitable habitat, uh, and only nine below the cascades. Following spring, we didn't find any fry at all. 2018, we found 28 uh, reds in the suitable habitat, 120, 192 below the cascades. Following spring, we found 48 fry uh, up in the uh, north branch reach. So, and then this, this Past fall, 2019, um, we found very few reds. There were only three in the north branch and one below the Cascades. Uh, and I wish I took a lot of pictures of this, but um, what happened was this is um, the, some USGS gauge data. And you can see the red line is the average uh, water height. And uh, although there's a lot of variability from, from year to year, you can see in 2019 we had this uh, very, very high water event, and that created a lot of scouring throughout the river pushed a lot of sediment down, so so much so that uh, this reach here, nearly 80% of it was covered in loose sand and fines. Um, so it really, um, any of the reds that were set up were, were probably mainly uh, blown out and washed away. So in summary, um, we've restored natural reproduction of salmon in the Lake Trout tributary. This is the first time it's been doc got documented in 150 years. It's very ex exciting and a, a big step forward. Um, but we still have some issues with a lot of variability in uh, the red abundance and distribution, uh, as well as uh, very large climactic events that could really impede the, the recovery of this fish over time. So looking after some of the next steps, um, one outstanding question is how many fish are approaching uh, the Cascades, but then also how many are passing over the Cascades? Is this a, still a barrier to their movement? <coughs> How many salmon can be? Uh, how, how many salmon can the river support? And what should our target goal be? When when do we know that we've, we've uh, fully recovered this fish to this river? And then our fish moving outside of our study area. Uh, we're, we're focused in the north branch to about here, but there's nothing um, suggesting that they wouldn't go further up the branch, especially now that the crown, crowning shield um, dam is gone. Um, and there's also thoughts that they could be going into uh, some of the other tributaries as well as up through the main stem. And then what co uh, covariates are driving site selection? So what areas are, are better than others? Um, we're going to work towards putting a non-standard uh, generalized linear mix model together um, just so we can, uh, there's definitely a possibility that we aren't seeing all the reds or all the fry, so it would be nice to estimate what proportion are we actually seeing and incorporate that into our model. And then finally, we'd like to identify where mortality is occurring once we do start to get uh, returning uh, recruitment of reds and uh, fry. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our funding source, uh, tons of partners, um, volunteers, and we'd be happy to take any questions.